Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 192 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guests are Dr. Christian Bogner and Alex Zaharikas, and the topic of the show is cutting-edge approaches in autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Christian Bogner is a lecturer, educator, and experienced practicing clinician. He has four children with his oldest affected with autism. He is a certified functional medicine physician with additional board certification in OBGYN. He has obtained his certification in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. Dr. Bogner is a clinical consultant for MaxGen Labs, a nutrigenomics lab analyzing genetic data utilized by over 800 practitioners around the world. He has lectured throughout the United States and abroad regarding integrative approaches to disease with a focus on genetics, the microbiome, and toxicities. Alex Zaharikas is a grateful husband and father of two beautiful children. His interest in the microbiome and biomedical healing is driven by his son's regressive autism at 17 months after a culmination and spark of several timely medical insults, several of which were microbiome-focused. Alex has devoted his spare time and efforts to researching and learning about the microbiome while helping other parents to navigate the biomedical and microbiome issues experienced in autism to develop strategies for intervention. Alex is a licensed and board-certified medical physicist in radiation oncology, a scientist with a background in physics, mathematics, and biology, who has utilized his life experiences to develop an analytical method for quantifying and intervening with intestinal dysbiosis, which he believes to be significant in the development and severity of autism and other disease states. He has devoted his personal time to studying the microbiome through the analysis of 16S type sequencing, and he has developed a software to analyze raw 16S data and provide suggestions to improve dysbiosis in a targeted manner. Alex feels that providing support for dysbiosis is a direct window into increasing the quality of life for all individuals, including his own son, which has been the driving force in the work that he does. And now my interview with Dr. Christian Bogner and Alex Zaharikas. I'm excited today to have Dr. Christian Bogner and Alex Zaharikas on the show to talk with us about cutting edge treatments in autism. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Scott. Thanks so much. First, let's talk about how each of you got into working with children on the spectrum. Did you have a personal experience that fuels your passion for the work that you're doing today? So for me, it was uh, my son. You know, my son has autism. He had regressed around 17 months. You know, at that time, we were kind of naive just because we were trying to seek out what was going on and, you know, get doctors and physicians involved. You know, it became apparent to me over those, during that regression period that, you know, the the behaviors and the changes in him had a uh, cyclical nature to them that was not explainable in, you know, from, with my background, you know, I think of kind of a disorder as something being kind of, you know, somewhat static and, and having some kind of continuity in, in its features. But uh, I noticed very early on that there was a kind of a time dependent relationship between things that he ate and also when he went to the bathroom. And that's how I kind of got involved into researching and trying to figure out what was going on with him. Then, you know, obviously I made it my mission and my goal to like spend every, you know, moment in my free time, even when I was at work, just researching, trying to make those connections. And I found some things that were helpful with him. We consulted a lot of practitioners, you know, I was always listening, trying to basically stuff up as much knowledge as I possibly could. You know, there are things that certainly helped him and, and over time that kind of evolved. And I realized that. Um, there was other people that were that had the same situations that 
you know, didn't know anything about the, uh, you know, biochemical components, the GI components, the medical component associated with autism. So, you know, very slowly, it was, it was kind of awkward for me, but, um, you know, people that were kind of in the circle that I knew that had kids with autism, I would say, hey, you know, you should look into doing this or this, and you might see some improvement. And I got some positive, positive feedback from just some small suggestions. I wasn't really an avid Facebook user, but I realized that there was a huge community for this on Facebook, and I started a group, and basically along the same lines of work, trying to help people, the things that I knew were helpful. Um, and that kind of involved into other things. But I, I found that it was therapeutic for me because not only could I uh, help other people potentially, but I could also get insight to the things that they were seeing and make some more connections and say, oh, you know, maybe this is what's going on here. Um, so it's really exciting for me. You know, it's 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 taken over my my life in a good way that you know it's my primary interest now prior to this you know I was focused really kind of in physics and you know pure math type of um you know science but this really has interested me and I try to leverage all of my skills for that yeah I have a similar background my son is uh, autistic as well he's 18 his name is Phil and he also regressed so I think that's a that's a big component of what what you know, made me interested in researching autism because he was developing fine, had some words, and then, you know, something happened. I think it was uh, the inoculation that he got, just like 90% of parents that I consult with echoing that. And so I couldn't accept that. So I found myself immediately like, what is autism and how could that have happened? And so I, in a way, became obsessed, like Alex said, and, and at the same time, fascinated of, you know, how this could then happen to so many others and that there's not more done about this, you know, and just basically got, you know, uh, sent through the grapevines through, you know, ABA therapy, speech therapy, you know, two years of speech therapy, not one word was gained. And so I started to research, you know, other uh, more biomedical approaches that were available at that time. You know, back then it was um, called the Dan Doctors. And we only had really one in the state here. And I saw him and we started with some methyl B12 injections. And then, you know, he did very bad with it. And I was wondering why are some kids doing really well with it? Why are some doing bad with it? And then learned about methylation and genetics. And, you know, one thing led to the next, you know, genetics led to the immune system, to the brain, to the liver, to the GI ultimately as the, I think, final frontier uh, that we have to tackle. But yeah, so that led me into hours and nights spent researching this and, you know, eventually switched my entire career. You know, I was a board certified and still am uh, OBGYN and, you know, busy practice, doing surgeries, doing delivering babies. And I completely left that about six years ago to focus uh, solely on, you know, helping other parents um, discuss autism. That's been my life for the last six years from Monday to Sunday. And, you know, over the last six years, I've been consulting extensively with families affected with autism, you know, and like Alex said, we've seen everything under the sun of what they have tried, gained insights onto what works, what doesn't work, and done tons of testing with different tests. And kind of over time, I, I would say over the last six years, really from like an overwhelming mountain of, you know, things that you could do from chelation to h bot to stem cells to antiviral pants, pandas, you know, all of these things that were out there kind of narrowed it all down to almost kind of one final thing that we, we, we think we need to do, which is the microbiome. And, you know, we've been focusing on that. I met Alex about two, two years ago, you know, while I was consulting and primarily focusing on mold toxicity and genetics and neurotransmitters and of, of those sorts and, and blood work. And, you know, Alex was focused on the microbiome. We kind of joined forces. We saw both in our children, all of a sudden this kind of extra, you know, spike of gains that we saw in our boys. And we're like, hey, we got to join forces and, and come up with something that's easier, learn from our mistakes. Like you said, I'm surrounded by probably 300 different bottles of supplements that I have now meanwhile uh, boxed up but uh, it's ridiculous you know and you know really started to minimize testing because the you know, test is going to be abnormal and i saw so many abnormal tests and you act on them and there was no improvement and so i think finally we got somewhere 
after all of these years, and I've been looking at this for, for 16 years now, for the last six years, very extensively. And uh, it's exciting because kind of the hard work seems to be paying off because uh, we finally have some answers. It is very exciting. And I think many children and parents are benefiting from and will continue to benefit from your collaboration. Let's talk a little bit about that the, the, the core issues that you've kind of come to believe are drivers of autism. So what do you see as the top contributors to autism? Are we talking about primarily dysbiosis, the microbiome? Are we talking about mold exposure or chronic infections or something else? How do you view autism today? Uh, that's, that's an excellent question, of course. So in, in regards to the top contributors, just to give it to you straight up, it's the microbiome. I don't see another reason for for autism, you know, everything from the microbiome turns a lot of different knobs in people causing different issues, depending on their environmental exposures to their genetics and, um, you know, the diet, of course, as well. But I think the microbiome, they, I, I believe they're early in life or already in utero, there is an insult. May it be uh, medications such as antibiotics, may it be inoculations or, or some, some you know, maybe not so much dietary sources or, or other toxicities. And so I believe that the uh, microbiome is really the target because of us seeing good results by uh, targeting it. Of course, there's much more to it, you know, in regards to the approach, you know, a lot of things start happening when the microbiome is, is in imbalance, you know, GI inflammation that leads to leaky gut, which leads to trafficking of protein toxins into the liver and you know depletion of glutathione in the liver with spilling of toxins into the blood causing these immune reactions and then the effects on the brain so in between a, a lot of things need to be addressed and looked at in my opinion but again you know i think alex had that um, in his recent blog article mentioning if you if you stand in front of a house and there was a fire and inside you see uh, you know some rodents and some animals that are in there and you see that there's a water leak and you know there's also an electrical problem with a wire you know what started first what caused this this disaster um you know you, you see a mess but where do you start to investigate of what could have caused this in the beginning and oftentimes we don't know but we know what we're working with and again i think by going to the root which i believe is the uh, we believe is the microbiome at least we can start there and see what we you know what trickles down from that what positive effects trickle down from that and and so i, I cannot point to one single reason i i'm very suspicious of the uh, aggressive inoculation schedule that we have in the united states and other countries as well i mean if we look at the rates on, of autism in the 1990s and compared to now or even compared to 1980s, I mean, there's a hundred thousand percent increase of of autism rates. You know, over the last two dec three decades, it's it's been about two thousand percent increase in, in autism. You know, one one in twenty eight boys are, boys are affected according to the latest CDC statistics. It keeps going up. There's no help from academia, and so that's why Alex and I we. It's our life mission to to investigate and see what we can do to help our kids. So, and when you use the term microbiome, are we talking primarily about beneficial organisms? Or are you also using that to consider things like parasites and pathogenic bacteria and other organisms that might also be part of the microbiome that need to be considered? I think we're kind of in a place where we're we're hostage to the information that we know, and and right now the the testing is really. I would say more complete at the bacterial level. And, you know, obviously you can test for things like fungi, but it's significantly, it's a much more complicated type of sequencing. Um, there's a lot more challenges. So we have technology that makes, you know, bacteria, you know, think about it from the perspective of the therapeutics that have come out, right? Antibiotics were something that kind of were invented first and then antifungals and things like that. So, I mean, obviously there's, there's issues with, with viruses, fungi, parasites. My, you know, kind of school of thought is, is that, you know, the, the, the bacterial microbes play a significant role. And if we can bring some sort of balance to them, and we know the most about them, we, we the, the library of sequencing is most complete for them. We know we have the most literature about them. 
we know how to kind of shape things with herbs and prebiotics and probiotics that we can start to bring balance to those other areas. So uh, I, I'm willing to admit that there's a lot that we don't know, but I think that if you just try to, you know, bring your microbiome at the bacterial level closer to someone, you know, in the middle of the, 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 the population, that chances are you can, you know, get some improvement and healing just from that. And whatever improvement that you get there, then you could leverage and carry on to see hey, maybe it's appropriate time to go after the fungal issue a little bit more. And, and I honestly think that if you don't do it in that order, it's not as efficient. I don't think you're going to get the same effect that if you try to kind of stamp out all of these things that might show up on the testing that just because we have tests for them, I think if you were to kind of work on the gut first, bring some sort of balance that those interventions become more successful. So let's talk then a little more about what you refer to as gut balancing. And then specifically, what is the 16S microbiome testing that you use? Talk to us a little bit about this gut balancing system that you've put together. Yeah. So the the, the 16S technology is, is not new. It's been around for a while. And uh, basically, the, it's the you're looking at the 16S gene in this prokarya, it makes up archaea and bacteria. It's a gene that's conserved. So what that basically means is, is that if that gene has any alteration in it, it's very crucial to the function of the ribosome and that, that particular microbe just kind of dies. So the conserving property of it is, is that you can sequence it and not really have to worry about mutations in it evolving over time because that that microbe won't function if it's mutated. The other advantage of looking at the 16S gene is, is that, you know, from beginning to end, in terms of the sequencing of the of the of the base pairs or the nucleotides, it's not very long. So typically when you're looking at uh, sequencing, let's say in the, the V3, V4 region, which is a variable region in that gene, it's like, you know, 300-ish base pairs or 250 base pairs. So you can use technology that, you know, was basically around from PCR and PCR is involved, is involved in it to basically amplify this DNA and not have to worry about sequencing long pieces of DNA. There's challenges in sequencing long pieces of DNA. Very simply, it's like trying to count to a million and not fouling off. The reader has to sequence the next base pair and there could be errors in doing it the longer that it gets. So it's a nice conserved region. Um, certainly there are technologies out there that are more, you know, people would say advanced, but the advantage of 16S is that we, we have so much information. The library of sequences of those microbes are very complete. The majority of the literature is based on 16S. So, you know, with each technology, there'll be slight changes because of what's going on. You're looking at the, the you know, the DNA coming from the ribosome or not. But it's a it's an affordable it's an affordable type of sequencing. It's conserved. It's very quick. Um, it's very reliable. It gives you specificity most often to the species levels. And the other advantage that that a lot of people don't realize is that you know the way that sequencing works is that you have to ha know what that sequence is in your library to really identify, you know, I have this particular clostridium, you know, this is what the sequence of my library is, it matches, I know that I have this species in my sample. Well, the, the it's kind of a Goldilocks region with 16S that, you know, the, the differences between species are enough that you can kind of resolve to the species level oftentimes, but they're similar enough that when that sequence isn't in your library, you can at least identify it at a higher level of hierarchy. So I know what this genus is, or I know what this order is. I get some information when I don't know what it is based on the similarities to other microbes. And you lose that when you go to higher level testing, like, like metagenomics. The, the sequences are just so vastly different that you don't know what it is. So it gives you a picture of the entirety of the sample in terms of percentage abundances. And you can see kind of really what is going on there. Are you walking into a garden where it's entirely full of weeds, is entirely full of, you know, some kind of tree, or is there some, you know, balance that's already existing in there? And what the gut balancing is, is basically an approach where um, 
you know, I, I combine, you know, three concepts. Uh, there's an analytical analysis on the dysbiosis um, that I've kind of made some software and put together. I tack on some literature that based on the abundances of the microbes that you have, you know, these papers suggest, for instance, hey, if you take curcumin, it would be appropriate in bringing down this particular overgrowth. Um, and then I combine some kind of expert, uh, I would say clinical and practitioner information out there on what do you do in certain situations that have really kind of come from those you know, clinical experiences. Uh, you know, I, I really borrowed a lot of it from Dr. Jason Harlack, who is an expert on the microbiome. And he really had, he was kind of the first practitioner that really tipped me off to the power of the prebiotic and, and the, what that could do for, you know, rebuilding beneficial microbes. One of the observations that you've seen in some children has been high levels of Prevotella. So talk to us about your observations with Prevotella and mold patients specifically. Could it be that external environmental exposure to mold or mold metabolites might have some impact on Prevotella? And can external exposure to mold in our environment negatively affect our overall microbiome? Yeah, it's really interesting. And I, I think that you know, we're going to figure this out um, over time. But, you know, the, the connections that we have are when this particular Prevotella, and it's Prevotella copri, but there's other Prevotellas that exist out there that seem to have the same kind of dynamic. When you find it overgrown in a particular microbiome, and what we're talking about overgrown is, you know, I've seen it as high as taking 90% of the entire microbiome, which is a number that is just absolutely... I mean, you don't really need to know much about the microbiome other than, you know, you should have several hundred species in there. And if you have one taking up 90%, that just doesn't sound right. So that, that was kind of very shocking. And, and that and it wasn't quite 90% for my son, but it was very high. And, and that's what piqued my interest in, in the analytical component of it. But I started to make some connections anecdotally that many of these individuals had some exposure to, to, to mold and mold environment. And it became so concrete from my perspective that I was telling Dr. Bogner, I was referring them to Dr. Bogner after they would do a GI test and say, hey, this person's going to have high mycotoxins. And it was like 100% every single time. There is literature out there to show that Prevotella in, in, in the vicinity of different fungal species feeds on arabinose and mycotoxins. So there actually is literature out there to support that already. There has been found Prevotella overgrowths in people that have HIV, and we know that they can succumb to fungal issues. There was some testing in animals done where, um, you know, it's, it's known that Prevotella overgrowths are very common rheumatoid arthritis. And what they were trying to do was they were trying to colonize these mice with Prevotella and reproduce, you know, their, their model of rheumatoid arthritis. And they were unsuccessful until they injected them with a fungal component. Uh, which was very interesting to me. There's also, you know, from the agricultural world, you know, they do a lot of studies on 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 mycotoxins and pigs and feed and stuff like that. And they found large relationships between animals that were fed food contaminated with mycotoxins and having these excessive blooms of, of Prevotella. So for me, there are certainly, you know, all of those pieces of evidence there and what I was seeing on these mycotoxin tests but also it had a very unusual dynamic in, in that it did, it's very difficult to treat and it didn't really respond this overgrowth in the same way that other microbes would. There were several situations that I personally had witnessed where an individual had done a test and their level of Prevotella was quite low. It was actually, you know, and, and typically in the, in the poor population, it's like a tenth of a percent is what I would say like 80% of the population has it at that level. So they would have it at that level and they would do some kind of intervention. Sometimes it wasn't even through me, but they had two tests. Either they took a probiotic or they got some kind of sickness and then they did another test or they did FMT. And this happened probably about seven times. And the second test had elevations of Prevotella 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% going from near zero to 60% of the microbiome. So there, to me, there was this mechanism that we must be hitting on some kind of fungal component that is feeding this microbe. 
And then the the other things that really stood out to me is I had come across three infants, uh, a microbiome at the age of eight months, 12 months, and 18 months, where there isn't even a dietary component involved there. I mean, the, the child is primarily on some kind of formula or or they're being breastfed. I mean, there's no solid foods because there's always a big pushback from many of the microbiome researchers that Prevotella is highly you know, geographically registered in terms of the diet, despite these kids having completely opposite diets. And, and in these microbiomes of the infants, I, I saw them at 50, 60, 70% taking up. And they were cases coming to me because there was suspecting of autism, there was odd behaviors, and there was also confirmation that there was mold in the home. We have visible evidence taking pictures of it. And oftentimes it, it involves several people in the family. Like, you know, there's three people in the house. Two of them have very high elevated Prevotella copri. So I, I've seen that tons and tons of times. So there, there's certainly a connection there with a fungal component. I even think that there's a connection there with a viral component. Um, there was some literature that came out recently that mentioned that there may be a phage component or a virus that infects the Prevotella. But it's a, to me, it's very interesting. And it's something that I think would be, uh, you know, directly in line that if you can try to treat this, you can certainly see improvement in symptoms. I want to come back to the mold conversation in just a minute, but I want to touch a little more on the prebiotic topic before we move on to the mold conversation. So talk to us a little bit about using prebiotics to optimize the microbiome. Can we use prebiotics like GOS, for example, maybe to help fortify our bifidobacteria? And why, why is bifidobacteria so important today? And then the other piece that I want to touch on as well is, do you find that people tolerate prebiotics? My observation in working with adults has been that a lot of times if they're dealing with SIBO or some other small intestinal overgrowth, maybe they can't tolerate prebiotics early on, they need to do some other work first? It's a good question. Yeah. There's certainly prebiotics that I would put in the class of SIBO safe or SIBO safer. So, you know, the, the, the pH in the gut is something that is, you know, there's, there's literature out there to show that it's heavily implicated in controlling the pathogenic state of what grows in the microbiome. You know, it's kind of like the, the the temperature, right? Almost for kind of growing a plant or something like that. I mean, the body temperature is pretty stable. The only other thing that you can really control is the pH. And the pH is, uh, there's been studies shown that the level of bifidobacteria scales with the pH. So having lower levels of bifidobacteria creates a more alkaline environment in the gut. And there's a lot of, you know, information out there about going alkaline and having it be healthy. And, you know, people should understand that, that, there isn't necessarily a direct relationship between drinking something alkaline and actually changing the the you know the uh, pH component in, in the gut. More more often, you want to have a more acidic type environment that's going to kind of keep pathogens out. There's also certain fungi that will, in a pH environment, tend to behave more like molds. Some yeasts start to form colonies in a more uh, alkaline environment. So um, that's why I think bifidobacteria is so important and bringing it up can just be a significant game changer in trying to battle perpetual dysbiosis. And it's your question about the prebiotics now, you know, there's kind of a school of thought out there that, you know, probiotics were on the scene first, really, they were the things that were most advertised. That's the way that you're going to fix your, your gut, but most probiotics are not going to colonize. So you have to really feed these beneficial microbes to get them a place at the table. Prebiotics like PHEG, uh, partially hydrolyzed guar gum, are very appropriate for situations for SIBO because they help to kind of uh, improve the motility. They draw water in the colon. You don't want to kind of start, you know, taking a spoonful of it, but it's something that you can introduce slowly. And I would say the next probably most appropriate one would, would be GOS. GOS is actually helpful in um, hydrogen sulfide SIBO of formed by the sulfibrio species. So it, it's not something you want to jump into. It, I tend to kind of layer the my gut balancing program where we start with herbals and some probiotics to kind of damp things down. And then we slowly introduce and ramp up the prebiotics. 
but it's always important to know, are you walking into a case where there is this, this SIBO overgrowth? Um, because the, the, the patient at the very least will be much more reactive to things and you certainly have to support motility and keep things flowing. There are certain prebiotics that are gonna be contraindications like lactulose will make certain types of SIBO even worse. But lactulose is a very, very helpful prebiotic once you get past that. It's, it's, it's amazing what it can do um, in kind of you know repairing the gut. So all of these have a, things have kind of like a tool, just as if you were you know making a soup. There's an ingredient that you put in a certain time and a certain place. I want to get some thoughts now from Dr. Bogner around mold in his clinical practice. So what portion of your population of kids with autism would you say do have mold as a contributor to their autism? And then how are you at a very high level, how are you approaching treatment? Do you find that many of these kids have fungal colonization and maybe need antifungals when they do? Are you using more herbs or pharmaceuticals? Would love to hear how you're approaching that component of autism. Yeah, uh, great question. And, you know, I, I have to say, I probably I learned the hard way uh, because I, I jumped on the bandwagon with, with many other practitioners and, and parents. But, you know, it all started for me in, in 2019 when Sydney Baker with, with William Shaw, as you know, the CEO of uh, Great Plains Laboratory, which is now Mosaic, they had this case report reporting a complete recovery of this four year old boy with, affected with autism while using high doses of Spornox uh, for apparent mold. You know, they tested the urine and there were mold toxins there. So, you know, the conclusion of the study was, and I quote, it says, the lesson of the case we present here is that the child's microbiota may be the source of toxins that, once identified, will lead to the cure with an antimicrobial drug. So that was their conclusion. And, you know, they treated this kid for eight months with uh, high doses, even higher than adult doses of Spornox. And so many practitioners jumped on that bandwagon. Everybody was like, hey, I want to, you know, cure autism too. Can we try? And so I, you know, was on that bandwagon for about two and a half years, you know, having explored every type of anti-mold medication that's out there from Spornox to, you know, M4B to Voriconazole, Nystatin, Diflucan, all of these. And it seems like the community, not just in my practice, but in the community in general, we couldn't reproduce these results. And especially when you look at, you know, what is the end result? And, and, and my end result for these kids is, you know, functional speech. And, and so it didn't have that. Yeah, some patients got better, sure. But was it worth all of the testing, consultations, you know, treatment? I don't think so. And that's why I don't do that anymore. So, uh, in, in regards to testing, you know, there, there was, there, there are two companies that, that do the urine analysis of mycotoxin, which is Mosaic, which was formerly known as Great Plains Laboratory, and then there's real-time laboratories. And what they assess is the mycotoxins in the urine. And so we don't have really any evidence that there is colonization. It's just a, a concept, a theory. So is that actually the case? And you know, I consult with some of the biggest names out there in regards to experts, Neil Nathan or uh, Andrew Campbell, uh, some others. And I don't believe anymore personally that necessarily that the problem is colonization, that we actually have mold growing in our kids. I don't think so. And the reason is, you know, when, when you think about that there's mold colonization, mold is literally trying to compost you. It's trying to kill you. Mold has no mercy. It doesn't like to coexist. It uh, really, it, it wants to invade and, and put you six feet under. You know, we don't see any fatalities in, in autism of, uh, you know, severe mold sepsis. You know, look at an AIDS patient. They don't have an effective T-cell system to take care. You know, the natural killer cells are tanked and they have literally mold growing in their brain. They come into the ER, they end up in the ICU with an IV drip of amphotericin. We don't have that. If you think of, you know, if we would have children with autism affected with mold overgrowth in the gut, then any further triggers such as an infection, you know, they get sick or they get treated with a drug like steroids, you would think that the mold would invade and we just don't see that. And so, uh, you know, where could it be coming from? Because remember, we, we're measuring mold toxins, not mold. And, and so when we consider that the United States, you know, along with India and China has the worst crop quality on the planet, you know, with, for example, corn, more than 90% of United States corn is contaminated with more than one mold toxin. 
you can see that you know when you have nine out of ten cereals in the in the in the aisle contaminated with mold toxins, um, that that the, it's a it's a big challenge. You know, they found mold toxins in the breast milk of mothers in Brazil and in Egypt. And why is that important? It's it's important because of the approach. You know, when you have mold toxins in the urine, what does that mean? That means well, if it comes through dietary uh, through dietary sources whatever it may be why does it end up in the urine because it still has to travel from the gut you know through the gut barrier through the liver and then ending up in the blood mold toxins should not be in the blood if they're in the blood they get filtered and end up in the urine and that's where we measure them and certainly i would say maybe two out of hundreds of mold tests that that i've seen had no mold toxins uh, in 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 the urine so in regards to uh, the uh, percentage of autism, I would say all of them have mold toxins in there, but the reason for that is different. And the reason for that is, is a dysfunctional gastrointestinal system. There's dysbiosis and we have significant issues in the liver to grab these toxins. And that has to do with, you know, genetic processes such as binding these toxins, glutathione, you know, synthesis of glutathione, glutathione uh, binding proteins as well as sulfation, you know, like Stephanie Senna for 10 years has been preaching, our kids with autism have sulfation issues. And it's not just her, there's other literature supporting that sulfation is the issue. And as you know, sulfation is very important for detoxification. And so that's why a lot of these toxins end up in the blood. And when they end up in the blood, we have these immune reactions, we have histamine reactions. And as we know now, uh, we have the suppression of the immune system with these mold toxins. That's what they do. They suppress uh, the immune system. But what, what was most striking for me is then to eventually find out that actually the most common worldwide crop contaminant in regards to mold toxins is Dawn, which is also called vomitoxin. And interestingly, neither Great Plains or real time check for that toxin, even though it's the most common one. And it's a very bad one to have too. You know, the, those pigs that Alex mentioned, you know, they fed these pigs corn with infested, you know, with, the, with, with this Dawn toxin. And we have a lot of uh, insights into that. You know, these pigs lost weight. They were socially withdrawn. They had immune dysregulations. And we saw that this Dawn toxin is a strong uh, inhibitor of, you know, natural killer cells and also antibody, uh, antibody producing uh, immune cells. And I see that reflected in, in the blood work of these kids. You know, they have lower levels of these, uh, you know, IgG subtypes um, that are responsible for, you know, processes like phagocytosis. And if you don't have that, then these toxins will eventually make their way to the brain and cause inflammation. But what I'm, what I started to use then, you know, because they didn't check for that toxin, was to check Andrew Campbell's my micro lab to check actually the blood. And what he does, he checks 12 different, you know, mold toxins, including the Dawn toxin, and he checks IgG and IgE antibodies against those. And sure enough, the first five patients that came back, boom, all of them had high levels of IgE uh, antibodies against this uh, Dawn toxin until I eventually stopped doing that too. Because at the end of the day, if, if, if you see that, you know, and I have that clinical experience of having seen that. They, they have mold toxins in it. Why do I need to test for it if the treatment is not antifungals, but correcting the dysbiosis and correcting and helping the liver and supporting the liver to grab these toxins to keep them out of the blood? You know, I, you know, Jimmy over here has the same exposures of mold, you know, in the diet or, uh, you know, environmental exposures, but why is he fine? You know, what makes him different? Why is he not autistic, uh, let's say? And, and that has to do with exactly those mechanisms that he might have uh, working working different. So now in regards to, to testing uh, in, in your home, you know, of course, uh, there's mold behind your washer, uh, your furnace, your fridge. I use the immunolytics plates. I'm sure your listeners know that you can buy on Amazon. You can test whatever room you have, you know, and uh, they get you a nice report back. I mean, if there's obvious mold, of course, you should remediate. But do I think that mold is growing in your basement or behind the drywall and that's why there's autism? No, absolutely not. Of course, if there are cases where you have you know, successful progress and then you discontinue the, the therapy and then you have a relapse and there's maybe some mold. And I've certainly found, uh, you know, parents have found yeast in, in, in the bed of the kid because they dropped the banana under the, uh, under, you know, in, in, in between the bed and the, the drywall and nobody found it and it grew mold. Uh, 
Yes, those are cases, but the majority, I don't think that we need to spend thousands and thousands worth of, of, of dollars to, you know, have these companies come in, do a deep sweep and, you know, check and, and then treat. I think, uh, you know, it's an, on an individual basis. If you, if you have science, check, check these areas that are moist in your house. But uh, otherwise, I would say I would focus on, on different uh, areas first. Cyanide is a topic that we don't hear discussed much, particularly in chronic illness. I recently had a conversation with someone that shared with me that this is an area that you are exploring in your patient population. So tell us a little bit about cyanide, what role you think it may be playing, how can we test for it, and where do you believe it's coming from? Uh, and then related to that, if someone has elevated levels, what are some of the things that we potentially can do to help reduce it? So yeah, cyanide, you know, I didn't know much about cyanide other than, oh, death, right? <laughs> but um, so cyanide, you know, for your listeners, just review is, is a chemical compound. It's consisting of a carbon atom, triple bonded to a nitrogen atom. And the forms that are found in nature mostly are hydrogen cyanide, which is the gas, and sodium cyanide. The gas which is commonly used in the industry for, for example, for the production of plastics, textiles, or it's used in fumigation processes. But, you know, what we know about cyanide mostly is acute toxicity, you know, such as from intentional or accidental exposure in the industry, suicide, or the most common reason in the United States, which is house fires. So firefighters and burn victims virtually always have cyanide poisoning, you know, carbon, and nitrogen is what cyanide is. If you burn your couch, you're going to have cyanide poison. So when you come to the ER as a patient and you're a burn victim, you always get treated for carbon monoxide and cyanide poisoning. They don't even test you for cyanide. They just treat you, you know, based on clinical suspicion. And, you know, uh, but in regards to testing for an acute patient like this, they don't. And I've called Poison Control Center here in Michigan. I called Detroit Medical Center, talked to an attending in the ER. I'm like, walk me through, walk me through this. How do you, how do you approach a patient? I said, we don't test for cyanide. And the reason also is because cyanide, once you draw the blood, it quickly turns into hydrogen cyanide, the gas. And you would literally have to flash freeze the blood immediately before you run it through your sequencers. And, uh, and so it's, it's very, very difficult. Uh, in fact, it's a huge problem in forensic medicine. We talked to a forensic pathologist in Texas that says, all right, this patient died through burn, uh, through, through a house fire two days ago. And I need to determine, did he die by you know, carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning? You know, sometimes it's, I guess, for, for the courts, it's important. And they can't, they can't test the cyanide. And so there's a lot of research into that and finding markers that are specific for cyanide. But now I'm, I'm telling this is because we don't really know anything about chronic cyanide poisoning. Everything, all the literature is about acute. And, and so there's no real good test. And, you know, despite, you know, the FDA having an antidote approved since 1939, you know, there's not much known about cyanide poisoning. And the, and the FDA has approved sodium thiosulfate in 1939 for cyanide poisoning. But the question is, where could we possibly get exposed to, to cyanide was the question. And that came kind of through a back door because we, we've been using you know, the antidote in a lotion form. And the question came up one day, like, what well, could it be that this lotion uh, with the sodium thiosulfate, could it be that it potentially targets cyanide? And so we explored that idea, but because of the testing difficulties, it was difficult for us to prove. And so we still don't know if that's the case. However, you know, anecdotally, and I certainly don't want to say that this is a fact, but, you know, there are these cyanide testing strips that test water. And I've, we've, kind of validated the methodology of these testing strips uh, with a, an, an expert in South Dakota that has a patented cyanide analyzer. But so these testing strips, we thought, well, why wouldn't it pick up cyanide in saliva if it picks up cyanide in water? And uh, certainly once you know we experimented with that, every patient that came back had elevations of cyanide on these testing strips. And and so then we were like, oh my God, you know, this, could this be a true issue? And, you know, we started to explore where could it be coming from? And so what we found is, well, we know cyanide is in our food. Um, you know, the EPA and FDA don't even deny that fact, uh, such as, you know, foods like cassava or lima beans or bamboo 
or dark chocolate from Lind, they found cyanide, or even cruciferous vegetables contain cyanide. Now, I agree that's with the FDA and EPA, it's not enough in our food to cause disease because we have mechanisms to deal with those low levels of cyanide. However, knowing that, for example, there's also mold species, Aspergillus niger, can produce cyanide, and we have such mold contaminated crops in this country, and it's not routine practice in the United States to check our crops for cyanide. Could we underestimate this? But I don't know. But is it the food really that causes autism? No, because you know, I'm, so many patients and parents uh, that have changed their diets to extreme organic, you know, everything free kind of ice cube diets, and they didn't see any magic. And so what we did discover is that there are bacteria in the microbiome that can produce cyanide. Two examples, Pseudomonas and Prevotella. And you know, to give you a good example of to kind of validate this, there is actually uh, something that was brought up to our attention from the lab director in South Dakota. He's like, man, this is interesting that you guys think that cyanide might be uh, you know, part of the etiology of autism. Have you guys looked into Conzo disease? And I'm like, Conzo disease, what's that? And so when we looked it up, you know, Conzo disease is a disease that develops in the deep Congo in very poor areas of the Congo and the tribes there that grow cassava flower. And, you know, cassava, usually you need to treat that for about three days in water. It's called watering to get rid of the cyanide. But, you know, they don't, because of the, you know, economic situation, there's wars, there's you know, often violence. They don't have the ability to, to do that, to do that. And so the the question comes up, do you want to starve to death or do you want to eat that cyanide food? And of course, you know, I would eat, eat the food and take my chances, but this disease called Conzo developed and they found that these children were poisoned with cyanide. And interestingly, when you look up Conzo disease, the first picture that comes up on Wikipedia is a kid that stands on his tippy toes, you know, which is a common feature that we see in, in autism, for example. And also when you look at some of the reports when the doctors came in, there's rapid hand movement and lack of speech. And so it's interesting that we find now when they analyze the microbiomes of these uh, individuals that they also had high levels of Prevotella copri in Conzo disease. And, and so, yeah, I think the origins of cyanide are the microbiome. I mean, there are more fascinating things about cyanide. You know, if you stimulate a neuron with uh, opioids, the brain generates cyanide from scratch. It's not the cyanide that comes from the outside. The neuron can develop, it can produce cyanide from scratch if, it, if it's stimulated by opioids. So it's fairly fascinating. Last but not least, you know, there, there, there is some concerns. Uh, again, I have no proof of this, but some concerns that we're looking into in regards to the use of cyanide in the development of um, inoculations. Um, such as hepatitis B, the Prevnar, also the MMR. Again, um, I don't have any proof. It's you know just something that we're interested in researching to see if there could be potentially cyanide in those. So from a microbial perspective, it sounds like some fungal organisms, some bacterial organisms may produce or contribute to cyanide in the body. Uh, parasites are not uncommon in children with autism, some also dealing with Lyme and co-infections. Do we know if any of those might also be contributors to the cyanide burden in the body? Yeah, and I think a lot of this probably hasn't been studied yet. Uh, I mean, Alex, maybe you, you have an opinion about this, but I know that nematodes are able to generate cyanide. But other than that, I think it's just some very understudied area of research in regards to cr chronic cyanide toxicity in general. Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, if you look at the totality of the evidence, you know, someone kind of listening to this from the outside probably thinks that, you know, this is the most ridiculous sounding thing in the world. How, how do these kids have bacterial issues, fungal issues, mycotoxins, parasites? They they have uh, immune issues, dysautonomia, heavy metal toxicity, Lyme, Bartonella. How is it possible that, you know, you're pinning this all on? And, and I think that what it comes back to is, is that, you know, if you take two individuals, one that has, let's say, an, an immune system that's just depleted or the microbiome is depleted, and you expose them to the world, the threats of the world, right? So, I mean, there's going to be a house that you're going to go into that's going to have mold. But if you don't have your shields up, 
are you going to be able to withstand that burden? In the same way, I think that there's people that could be exposed to Lyme that are able to fight it off. So when you start th- seeing these things pop up at the tests as being positive, um, I think it's just a feature of the immune system not functioning well. I mean, you're going to build up cyanide. There's, there's modes of detoxification for cyanide in the body. Some of them involve bacteria. And like Dr. Bodner was saying, you know, the liver is heavily involved. But if your liver is burdened with everything else that it has to get rid of, the LPS, you know, all of the toxicity, you know, it, it's going to have a hard time. So you're going to start to accumulate just like someone that doesn't have enough money to pay their rent. You're going to start to accumulate debt in different areas. So I, I think that all of these insults are, are entirely possible. And some, some people have all of them. And some people have some of them. And, um, you know, the way that I think you, you fight it is by, you know, bringing back your immune system, bringing back that balance, rather than trying to do the whack-a-mole approach. I think that those therapeutic, not to say that you're going to fix the gut and it's going to fix the entire issue, but my core thing is, is that I think if you can bring back that balance to some degree, now these therapeutics be, have more powerful, they're more effective. Your detoxification becomes better. So it, it, it's like having a strategy at play rather than, you know, trying to treat something with antibiotics for two years or trying to, you know, trying to attack something with antifungals for two years. I think that those prescriptives would be more effective because I think the dominant effect, honestly, from a killing perspective in the immune is the immune system in the body. It's, I think it's misunderstood entirely that you, know, you take an antifungal and it goes and it kills the yeast. It does. But then what, what gets released, your body mounts an attack to that. And that's the dominant effect, at least in somebody that's healthy, right? That's what's going on there. So your immune system responding to those antibodies that are produced, those antigens or, that are produced. So if you don't have that behind you, then it's, you know, kind of like a gun that just fizzles and you keep on taking it. And, and no one really talks about the other effects that taking those prescriptives are. Everyone thinks like in this linear dependence, hey, this antibiotic is going to go after this bacteria, but what does it do to the fungi? And similarly, you know, I could take something like Diflucan, but no one ever talks about its power to actually affect the, the bacteria. Just because it's patented as an antifungal doesn't mean it has antibiotic properties to it. So what we find looking at all of these herbs is that they affect everything. There's herbs that they have antimicrobial, antifungal, and antiviral properties to them. So you kind of have to really just have balance in, in the forefront there. I, I totally, I've seen lots of cases where there's Lyme involved and things like that. But is it the, is it the, the spark? It's possible. But I really think that having a depleted immune system, it's not the cause, but it's the shields going down. And now anything can come in and make that spark and just tip you over the edge, whether it be like Dr. Christian, Dr. Bogner said inoculation, or you get some kind of, uh, you know, swarm of, of mycotoxins, or you have some exposure to heavy metals. They they tip you over and and not having that shield up is what makes or or breaks the difference. Yeah. I mean, I think early on in my own personal journey with Lyme disease, I had the perspective that we can just kill these bugs. You know, I would be healthy. I think now, you know, killing the bugs really is quite low on the list of things that I think about to your point that we need to find ways to bring uh, tolerance and integration and modulation that those things are really more important. Another contributor that we hear in the autism realm commonly is ammonia. So wondering if you can talk just a little bit on where is the ammonia coming from? Is this more genetic? Is this also coming from infections? And then how do you, if you do work on reducing ammonia in these kids? And again, uh, you know, there's the chicken and the egg, I think, you know, is it the excess ammonia that we produce, or is it the inability of our body to deal with the ammonia and break it down properly? You know, in general, you know, protein, dietary protein contains nitrogen. And when we break down food, the nitrogen um, undergoes a process of we call deamination. Um, and the ammonia then, you know, it's basically it's it's a nitrogen atom and, and three hydrogen atoms, and which makes it very highly soluble. And so we have start to absorb it. And so when we absorb the ammonia, the liver converts ammonia into urea, you know, in the urea cycle. And, you know, the urea is what we are able to pee out and we can measure that. 
but in order to convert the ammonia to urea, you know, there, there are genes involved and these genes respond to cofactors, you know, things like um, AKG, citrulline, arginine. And, and so what, when, when, when we talk about that, you know, I mean, there are bacteria, Clostridium, Bacillus, Enterobacter bacteria that can produce ammonia and certainly uh, higher in, um, in dysbiosis. Uh, as far as I know, yeast and uh, mold can produce uh, ammonia as well as well as, you know, parasites, parasites, uh, ammonia is parasite P, right? That's what they say. But yeah, in, in that regards, you know, in, in general, when we do microbiome balancing, I think that will eventually be you know, taken care of, but we can support the body. You know, we can support the liver with these three acids, you know, with the citrulline, arginine, and AKG. But, you know, as we know that if, if the liver doesn't have the ability to do that, the ammonia starts to end up in the blood. And of course, ammonia is highly toxic. And so in the brain, unfortunately, the, the brain doesn't have these mechanisms that the liver has to get rid of uh, ammonia. And so uh, in the brain, it needs to be looked at different, um, you know, in the brain, ammonia binds to actually to glutamate and it forms glutamine. And the problem is that, you know, when we maybe get into the glutamate discussion, you know, glutamate is absorbed by the astrocyte and in the astrocyte, it binds to ammonia to form glutamine. But if the glutamate is not absorbed by the astrocyte, we have two things happen. We have glutamate toxicity in the synapse and we have ammonia toxicity in the astrocyte, which causes swelling. And, um, and that's why uh, there we need to have a different approach, which is, you know, when we get to the glutamate discussion, we can touch upon that. But basically we need to have, you know, look at ammonia from, from three aspects. How can we support the liver? How can we support the brain? And how can we decrease its production? And so uh, the microbiome balancing is one, the liver we mentioned, and, you know, for the brain, uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But, you know, we do have a, a product we have developed for that. It's called Ammonia Away, and it has all of these ingredients in there. Arginine, citrulline, AKG, but it also has some other things like royal jelly, carnitine, and milk thistle, to, and some of the B vitamins and minerals to support that process. I just wanted to add one thing on the ammonia piece. Um, you know, the other... The other aspect of how we know it, it's ammonia. So, I mean, there you, you may have heard of Rett syndrome, and that's a genetic syndrome um, affects uh, girls. And that the, the status of that syndrome is a feature of hyperammonemia. It's, there's elevated ammonia in the syndrome. And there are some core symptoms that associate with that disorder. Some of them are teeth grinding um, and giddy laughter. And for me, when I saw that, I was like, whoa, because I, I was trying to track down, I had, my son had these symptoms, what these symptoms were coming from. And I had an idea of some things that were helpful, but it wasn't really, you know, it was kind of on the fence between two or th three things that could be the reason why he was doing these. So then I started to support, like Christian said, the urea cycle. And I saw that these symptoms essentially vanished. You know, so the 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 teeth grinding. If actually, if you look at uh, literature in there's some literature out there for uh, for for animals and in horses. Apparently, horses can succumb to bacterial dysbiosis and they get these states of extreme uh, ammonia burden. And they will do this feature of teeth grinding and head pressing. And head pressing is another thing that the kids do when they're at different times. Um, and it was really interesting taking these amino acids, you see these symptoms basically evaporate. Um, and the other thing too, with the, with the giddy laughter, it's really a combination of like overload of ammonia and, and nitrogen rich compounds too, because um, I found that, you know, if, if it was timed right, that ammonia burden with heavy rich nitrogen foods like meats or even chocolates would promote this giddy laughter. Well, that's basically the urea cycle backing up the nitric oxide cycle, and you get nitric oxide building up into the blood, which is laughing gas. You get in some of these kids, these states of, you know, laughter where it, it is so pronounced that, you know, they could literally fall off the couch, hit themselves on the floor in the face and be unfazed by it, by how, you know, how much nitric oxide is in their blood. And it's very difficult to measure ammonia because it peaks. You know, it's not like it's always elevated. This thing comes in waves. So even in the same day, I've seen people test and have both normal and abnormal levels of ammonia. 
Um, so it's very much related to the whole GI cycle and, and you know, the liver function and the processing. You mentioned earlier the idea of mast cells and histamine. I want to talk a little bit about neuroinflammation and the role that plays in autism. What are some of the tools that you maybe find most helpful for reducing neuroinflammation? And then since we're talking about the microbiome, about the gut, and about inflammation, is there a role for butyrate in addressing inflammation? How much of this inflammation in autism is maybe driven by mast cell activation, by histamine intolerance? And what are are some of the tools that you're using to address the mast cell and histamine component in these kids? In particular, uh, in regards to histamine and MCAS, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors involved with it. Of course, you know, where do we start? We start with the gut again. Too many toxins, the liver can't grab the toxins, and then we have histamine responses in the blood. You know, if an antigen reacts with a mast cell, histamine is released. You know, there are genetics responsible for histamine regulation within the mast cell called, called HNMT. If you have SNPs in that, then the mast cell releases too much. If you have problems with the DAO plasma enzyme um, breaking down histamine or you have methylation problems, the histamine keeps being elevated. And certainly um, histamine has been associated with autism, you know, among uh, many other disease processes, anxiety disorders, panic disorders, uh, schizophrenia. Uh, memory uh, issues and so forth. And so, you know, ultimately, I think it comes down to, to the amygdala. The amygdala has histamine receptors, and so do microglial cells. Mi microglial cells have all four uh, histamine receptors that we are aware of. And, you know, a hyperstimulation of, of these receptors causes, you know, chronic hyperactivation of the amygdala or fight or flight center. You know, it's meant to be just for situations to get you out of, but not chronically be elevated. And so this overactivation of, of histamine receptors causes inflammation of the uh, amygdala, uh, in my opinion, which, you know, we know causes all of these uh, behavioral issues. It, it can interfere with, you know, social cue, decoding, uh, speech, as well as just general anxiety, aggression you know, suppression of uh, melatonin being able to to act, you know, to get into these deep sleep cycles. But yeah, I, I think uh, in regards to how to address it, you know, we, again, we need to reduce the histamine and to strengthen the liver to keep these toxins out of the blood. But there are also other tools that we have in regards to, you know, the amygdala has other receptors, you know, it has endocannabinoid receptors, it has GABA receptors, uh, dopamine, serotonin receptors, oxytocin receptors. And so that there's a lot to work with in that regards, you know, for example, uh, just that we talked about the glutamate, glutamine ammonia axis not working, re reduces the ability for the brain to produce glutamine. And glutamine is the precursor for GABA. And so, you know, if we have these issues, that we talked about previously, then we just don't have the ability to produce GABA to, to cause this inhibition of the amygdala, you know, to restore homeostasis. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are some key factors. There are many other factors, of course, if histamine opens up the blood-brain barrier, we have other toxins like LPS or mold toxins possibly inflaming the brain. We have heavy metals. So from a, from a perspective of that is how do we address it is, well, let's bring up our glutathione Let's address that. Let's help the liver to uh, not get drained anymore by closing that leaky gut and fixing the uh, dysbiosis. But yeah, so in short, I would be the microbiome and the uh, glutathione levels to bring them back up. And we have tools for that. Yeah, and, and from, from a, uh, you know, an approach with working on the microbiome, I think some of the most important things are, you know, histamine and inflammation. I think they kind of just go, they're almost synonym, synonyms of each other. And, and if you can bring on therapeutics that, that, you know, like the flavonoids, like the quercetin and the luteolin and, and perilla is one that we like. We have a product that has all of these together with some anti-inflammatory you know, anti components like Bacopa, Boswellia, stuff like that. Those are really the, the best ways to kind of keep inflammation down, inhibit the mast cells from releasing more histamine. And, and then you just have to kind of have a strategy of make sure that the bowels are moving that you kind of evacuate things because as you start to, you know, tame the dysbiosis, you're going to get shedding of, of LPS. You're going to get stuff, debris kind of flowing. I mean, when, when, when the immune system kills a, a pathogen, it, it, it's like an amoeba. It, it kind of swallows it and it digests it and it does it in a way that is ideal so that there isn't a collateral damage. But when you're going in there and trying to change the ecosystem with 
probiotics and, and prebiotics and herbs, it's there's a lot of stuff flying around and you and you get inflammation and histamine responding to that. So um, you have to do it in a smart way. Pulsing is a, is a way that you can kind of mitigate some of the damage. But then a lot of people will shy away from taking things just because it causes a reaction. So you just want to make sure that you have the best supports on board. Know that that reaction, you know, is is somewhat, you know, inevitable, but it will diminish with time. Um, and the same goes with the sensitivities. A lot of people have sensitivities that just come out of nowhere and, um, you know, they'll, they'll stay away from food. So you have to have to kind of pick like a happy medium of not excluding everything, supporting your body, you know, but, you know, do, don't go into this little corner where you're eating one thing and then you're just ruining the diversity in your gut. It's, it's a hard, it's, it really needs kind of a hand holding. But as you start to get improvement, things become more accessible, things become more feasible. And I think that that's just the journey. You have to get to that first couple of weeks, first two, three weeks, and then you start to see kind of the, the, the magic start to take place. And for listeners, I think the product you were referring to was the histamine reprieve from researched elements, correct? So we'll talk a little bit more about those later in our conversation. I'm excited now to talk with you about the new ThioGuard lotion that we talked about just a little bit earlier, the sodium thiosulfate has many different mechanisms of action in the body. So wondering if we can just talk first a little bit about the history of it. How did you become interested in it? What is the history of sodium thiosulfate? Are there any clinical trials that have been done? And then what are you seeing clinically in those patients in your practice that are using this lotion? So about eight months ago, um, I was introduced to a family um, with a nine-year-old boy that was nonverbal. Uh, and on the autism spectrum. And um, what was unique about this, this uh, individual, his name was Jacob. I, sh I shared his story on my, on my Facebook, a beautiful family. And boy um, was able to communicate through typing. And it was, turns out he was extremely intelligent, you know, and that's not uncommon. You know, I've, some of your listeners might know about this uh, documentary called Spellers, you know, where they talk about six individuals uh, in their teenage years uh, with uh, nonverbal autism that effectively communicate. Oftentimes we find they actually have higher intelligence than uh, their peers. But uh, I started to engage with this uh, individual boy on a more conversational level. You know, I asked him questions, the parents asked him and gave me the response. And, you know, when, when asked about, is there a cure for autism? He said, yes. And, you know, he asked and he brought the abbreviation, you know, he mentioned SOS. Um, which when we researched this, you know, turned out to be sodium sulfite and he confirmed. And the sodium sulfite was actually the decontaminant in that study that Alex mentioned where they fed these pigs, this dawn corn infested uh, food, and they reversed the symptoms in the pigs. And so we asked him, hey, is it sodium sulfite? And he says, yes, 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 you know, but that's not it entirely. And so we started to, I continued to discuss chemistry with this nine-year-old boy until we got to, you know, one of the breakdown products of it, which is sodium thiosulfate. And I've never heard of it. And that's how we got to it. And he said, yes, 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 that's it. Interestingly, two weeks after I met that boy, another 15-year-old nonverbal boy from Italy that I've known and I've seen him here in Michigan uh, in person that just moved to Italy, he mentioned the same thing two weeks later, which is bizarre because they didn't know that I had a conversation with that boy uh, here in the US. And so it was very interesting um, that both of them mentioned this molecule. So when we started to look into it, you know, sodium thiosulfate is, as I said before, it's a sodium, uh, it's salt and, and sulfur. It just has a very special bonding property with it. And it's actually been, it was discovered in 1624. So it's it's been known, a known molecule since 400 years. It's just, again, uh, since the last 80 years or so, the FDA has approved it for cyanide poisoning and this ototoxicity in these cancer kids uh, and take chemo. But uh, so we, we, you know, patients started to use it and we saw these results that I have not seen in my practice before. You know, again, my goal is speech, functional speech. And we started to see that come back, you know, previously nonverbal kids starting to make sounds and then, you know, or kids that had just words started to string sentences together. So it was truly magic. And in fact, uh, in 1624, when Graubner discovered it, it, he called it miracle salt. And because it had cleansing properties and, 
you know, for 315 years, it was known as miracle salt. Just when the FDA started to approve it, it was no more miracle salt, right? Um, maybe for those that got saved from cyanide poisoning by it, but it kind of lost its its magic. And that's why probably none of us have heard about it, really, because it's just that single treatment that we have for it, or these two treatments that we have for conditions that we can treat it with. But anyway, so Alex and I, we started to embark on this journey of finding out everything we could about this, you know, from reading ancient texts that, you know, were published with this molecule, even before it was approved by the FDA from the 1920s, to more current work and research along with it. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of how we got to it. Maybe, Alex, you can talk more about the mechanisms that we discovered with it. But um, yeah, the, the history behind it goes all to back to the autism community. I guess we're just a vessel that transmits this information, but uh, I probably would have never come up with this, to be honest with you, especially also because I was kind of thrown back. I didn't even know about that the Don toxin is the most common mold toxin. And all of the tests that I did never even tested for it. So I don't know, maybe it would have taken another 10 years until we would have stumbled upon it. Maybe, maybe not, but all credit to those boys. So before we jump to the mechanisms, um, interested in whether or not there's been any clinical trials or maybe will be any clinical trials. And then since you've been using the sodium thiosulfate in your practice, what are some of the clinical changes that you've seen in these kids? First, we didn't know how to use it. And, you know, we were like, okay, what about its safety? So in regards to safety, we know that, you know, it's been around for a long time and, but we only had it approved in the IV form. So when we looked at the potential oral forms, you know, we, we, we saw that the FDA actually classifies it as a food chemical. It's, it's uh, in that category of, uh, we consider a grass, you know, generally recognized as safe. They add it to, to salt, alcoholic beverages, and it's used in the dried fruit industry for, to prevent browning of, of fruit. So it's a strong antioxidant. So there's a lot of clinical research in it. There are no randomized control trials in certain uh, conditions, as far as I know, but there's a lot of research into different conditions, such as preeclampsia, COVID uh, has some studies attached to it. There's uh, studies in regards to it being uh, cardioprotective, neuroprotective. There's a lot of, you know, kind of more laboratory research along with it. How does it work? You know, what does it do? How does, you know, what, and, and some of the discoveries uh, come from that, you know, what we know in regards to the mechanisms and the potential that it has. But in regards to like large clinical trials, no, we know it works and it still remains after 80 years, the treatment of choice for cyanide poisoning. You know, now we have hydroxycobalamin and sodium nitrate in the ER for cyanide poisoning. But yeah, I mean, like I said, there's not much going on in regards to, you know, actually studying certain conditions for it. Um, and that's unfortunate. So maybe, Alex, if you can walk us through some of the mechanisms through which this compound, this lotion might be supportive of the body. Yeah. So, you know, the way that I think uh, the way that really we, at that time when Dr. Bogner had kind of discovered this, we were really on the mycotoxin wagon and we were trying to figure out what was going on there. And I think it was even the Don toxin that kind of led us that, that was part of that conversation that he had with Jacob and uh, we, you know, we found that this molecule was effective, um, was used in agriculture for reducing uh, mycotoxins that would feed it to the animals. Um, so we, we knew that there was a mechanism there, but we weren't quite sure that, it, you know, that was the, the thing that we were seeing because when, you know, I started giving it to my son um, and I was taking it before that myself, it seems to have uh, an efficacy that it, it, you see something very quickly, like in the same day or the next day. And to me, that that, that there's no there's no way that you can remove mycotoxins that fast. So there there must be something else going on there. And we started to look at the different mechanisms of how it could affect what was going on. We realized that it was heavily implicated in recycling oxidized glutathione into reduced glutathione. And, um, you know, just from my perspective in not only with my son, but the individuals that I kind of work with, I've always felt that glutathione was kind of, you know, hit or miss that it, it did something or it didn't. And a lot of practitioners attributed to the form and, you know, you got to get the right form in there and it's oxidizing and all that stuff. But for me, you know, the knowing the deficits that my son had, he, he always had a 
deficit of this methylation cycle around the SAMe pathway. And I found that if you had a very high burden of uh, the literature supports this of oxidized glutathione, it can inhibit that pathway. So I started to think, you know, maybe this is what's going on here in this kid, in these kids that, you know, you can give somebody an infinite amount of glutathione, but then you start to build up all of these little wrappers of oxidized glutathione. What does the body do with that? If it can't get rid of that, you start to inhibit other processes. So we think that that is a, is a significant component there. It's not only recycling the glutathione, but taking burden off parts of the methylation cycle that might be inhibited by having too much oxidized glutathione. The other thing that really stuck out is, is that, you know, and it's well known that B12 is something that's used in autism and with varying results and you know, getting these methyl B12 injections or different other forms of it. But it's also known that uh, one of the counter arguments against it from many of the, the Western uh, medicine physicians is that if you measure the serum B12, it's is very high, even without giving them a methyl B12 shot. And there's a misunderstanding in terms of the form of B12 that's bioavailable there. Well, you know, we, we were looking into the, the mechanisms and we found that, you know, if you have sodium thiosulfate, it can actually convert your cyanocobalamin into a more bioavailable form, hydroxycobalamin. So we were starting to speculate maybe that there's a deficit of, of sodium thiosulfate for some reason, Maybe it's being used somewhere else to detoxify something else. And that's causing these high, high levels of B12, serum B12. So that could further improve the methylation status in, in, in itself. It's an antioxidant. So it has antioxidant properties to it. There's also an antifungal component to it. But if you're taking it topically, you're really not seeing that. And we went along the topical mechanism because, um, you know, it's primarily significantly destroyed by the stomach acid. And, um, you know, it has the potential to even change some of the microbiome there. Uh, so we didn't quite think that it would it would work. But uh, once we were able to give a stable form of it, we were seeing that the lotion, in some cases, was actually more beneficial than trying to kind of, you know, take sodium disulfate and suck on it and get it through the mucosa so that you're going to, you know, preempt that stomach acid. And, uh, you know, some of the improvements and and like I'm saying, this is anecdotal, this is this is what people have shared with us. We have screenshots of these things, but it's really in the area of cognition and speech and kind of overall calmness. And it it, it seems to happen fairly quickly. And like Dr. Bardo was saying, I, I've never come across something that has provided that kind of gain and benefit in such a short period of time. There are some other mechanisms involved there with regard to you know iron and oxygenation, but we, we think that overall, this is just hitting it on multiple places. And, um, you know, we're excited to explore and learn about it more. We have, we have you know, we have plans to do a study on it. It's just, uh, you know, we're trying to do a lot at once, but hopefully we can get things going there. You mentioned earlier, Dr. Bogner, that Dr. Stephanie Seneff talks about sulfate deficiency. Some people use Epsom salt baths to get magnesium sulfate. Wondering if you, with this sodium thiosulfate and the excitement around this, have you been in contact with Dr. Seneff to get any of her thoughts? Yeah, initially when we started to discover this and we saw these good results, and it's actually, she was the first person I reached out to because of her extensive work over the last decade in regards to, you know, telling us practitioners that autism is a sulfation problem. And uh, I don't know, many of us maybe didn't really know what to do from that point on, you know, okay, um, what do I do? Do I give uh, sulforaphanes, you know, from broccoli extract, you know, didn't have good results from that. And what did it really mean? And, you know, the, 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 truth to it is, you know, there's a difference between sulfites and sulfates, as you know, you know, the sulfites need to be converted to sulfates. You know, the, the sulfites are usually, you know, where you have to kind of watch out for allergic reactions. You know, if you say, oh, you have a sulfur sensitive patient, it's because of sulfites, you know, because the sulfites, if they don't break down how they should be break down or be breaking down with the SUOX gene, they form uh, sulfur di dioxide, which is, you know, causing these hives and uh, allergic reactions. But it, it is truly the, the sulfates that we need. And so the conversion is done by this gene called sulfide oxidase, which is, uh, you know, cofactors molybdenum. 
And but we didn't really see, or I didn't see much results with just giving molybdenum to those patients, even if I saw those SNPs on the genetic report. And so there must have been more to it. And so we know that if you have SNPs in the SUOX gene uh, to make that conversion happen, we know that there are triggers such as arsenic and tungsten, probably other metals that just haven't been studied yet, that can inhibit that gene even more, as well as uh, SENEP, you know, was kind of demonstrating is that glyphosate is inhibiting the sulfation processes. So, um, so in, in that regards, we have less ability to, to produce sulfates. You know, sulfates are important for many things, you know, they're part of uh, keeping your collagen healthy and uh, for detoxification purposes. But in general, it is really the form of sulfur that helps with detoxification, including, you know, the regeneration of the glutathione that Alex mentioned. And so in that regards, yeah, she was very helpful. In fact, she found it fascinating that she wanted to write a paper about this molecule sodium thiosulfate in autism, but didn't end up writing it. We, we started to write the paper, but we wanted to do the, the, that clinical trial with Brian. And so we kind of uh, didn't discuss it any further, but we thought that the clinical trial might be more beneficial to show, you know, what can we actually do? So in those people that are sulfur sensitive, don't tolerate onions or garlic or glutathione, do we need to be concerned at all that maybe they'll be intolerate, intolerant to the sodium thiosulfate do we need to be giving more B6 or molybdenum, or is that not an issue since this is sulfate? No, in general, sulfates are very well tolerated by uh, individuals, and it's fine in general to consume sulfates in sulfur-sensitive patients. Of course, always take precautions, start with low doses of that, but in general, we do not see uh, allergic reactions with sulfates. Again, it's because it's not able to form the sulfide, sulfide dioxide. I don't think that that is a problem in, in, in these individuals. So if we're using this sodium thiosulfate to help with the glutathione side of things, that's going to then support detoxification. Do we have the potential then to further or initially stress the organs of elimination, the liver? Do we need to be supporting the liver while we're using the lotion? And how important is kind of foundationally supporting our detoxification path Pathways, our drainage pathways when we're considering using something like sodium thiosulfate. Christian and I, when we started taking it ourselves first, we noticed that in the first couple of days, we got slightly constipated in doing it. And I had never been constipated before. And I was like, whoa, something's going on here. And I don't know that we kind of connected the dots and things were kind of like fine after that point. But some of the initial feedback that we were getting in some of the individuals is that it was aggravating constipation. And what we were envisioning what was going on is, is that you're just basically dumping, you know, drawing out toxicity and it's going directly into the gut. And this is a, you know, a class of individuals that, you know, classically have higher issues with constipation problems as it is. So it became very apparent to us from the beginning is, is that no one should be using this without having supported motility before going into it, or at least have a handle on, on that you know, because you can conjugate as much as you as you want. If you can't actually get rid of it through the bowels, then you get this this backlog there. The general approach that we have, you know, in the collaborations, we kind of have the same ideas as that these these kids, and we're often dealing, we deal with some adults, but often with kids, they need to be supporting these pathways even before starting any intervention. So that the gut balancing. So they're usually on a broad spectrum vitamin. They're possibly some kind of adrenal support, some kind of ammonia support, um, you know, something for, for histamine. If those symptoms are very, very apparent, certainly constipation and motility is at the top of the list in terms of the symptoms. Um, we need to make sure things are, are flowing and, and, and moving before doing anything, before doing gut balancing. So that would be kind of the precursor to anybody that wants to use it, particularly in this class. Make sure that constipation isn't something that you deal with. And if it is, you should try to tackle that first. We have some products for that um, because, you know, detoxifying too fast is, you know, is a problem. And then there's also the, you can also start to draw out some mineral content too as well. So it really kind of, we we find that this is a tool that pairs well with the microbiome balancing, although some people have just started taking it themselves and seeing benefits. But we think that really pairing them together, that's how you can uh, avoid any of those potential complications and really maximize the, the improvement. 
So your constipation product, I believe that's the Motility Max, which I'm excited about as another tool in the arsenal. Wondering if there is a place for binders when we're talking about the use of the lotion. Obviously, binders, generally speaking, can be somewhat constipating. So I think we'd want to address and improve the constipation issue first, but then to minimize some of these potential detoxification type reactions with the sodium thiosulfate, should we also be incorporating some binders? Is that going to help minimize some of that enterohepatic recirculation of these toxins in the digestive tract? I've kind of gone back and forth with the, with the blinders. Um, I think that they're a good idea. And the reason why I go back is just because of the, the complexity of the, the program and having to take too many things. But typically what I would tell the individuals would be um, is, you know, I, I, I just like kind of something simple like activated charcoal rather than kind of getting complex with, you know, specific targeting binders and worrying about maybe sources of contaminations, different clays and stuff like that. I, I would find that I would just tell them to say, hey, you know, do activated charcoal maybe two or three times a week before going to bed so you kind of stay away from any uh, food content or worrying about reabsorbing any minerals that you might have eaten with a meal. I know that you can get very exotic with it, you know, and timing it after taking something. And that's probably offers slightly a little bit more, ad, you know, advantage, but it gets very difficult feasibly to, to, to implement that. And, you know, you start to kind of lose sight of, I think, what's important. So, I mean, I think activated charcoal, that's kind of my favorite one that I like. It's slightly constipating. It's simple. It's hard to really get a, a bad activated charcoal, I think. I think it's something that we need to look into. And Christian and I have talked about maybe coming out with a specific binder that we like. Yeah. Um, I, I used to use binders, even, you know, well coal, uh, and then looking at these charts, you know, comparing like which binder is for which mycotoxin. And I don't use them anymore. I, I didn't see much with that, to be honest with you, uh, at least personally, I'm sure others have different opinions, but glutathione is my favorite binder. So glutathione binds everything. You know, we live a hundred years if we're lucky on this planet because we get exposed to thousands of toxins in our life and glutathione does its job. It binds mold toxins, it binds heavy metals, it binds food chemicals and everything. That's what it's designed to do. And uh, and so I don't think, uh, I, don't, I don't use uh, any binders anymore. So talking then about glutathione, we've talked about the sodium thiosulfate as potentially being able to help recycle or move our oxidized glutathione back to reduced glutathione. Is it possible if someone is using exogenous glutathione that they might need to reduce that once they start using the lotion? Yeah, I think it's a it's a fine balance. You know, the, the cycle needs to keep moving, and so we have a certain capacity, of course, of how many toxins can we bind. And so, at, at when when you get to that point, I think you, you need to be really know what you're doing in regards to you know watching your symptoms. You know, listen to your body. What can you take? What can you not? You know, if you if you have if you take the lotion and you see more symptoms, you know, uh, you have to kind of differentiate. Is it because of a histamine? Or is it because more toxins got liberated and you could benefit from maybe more glutathione or NAC? I think it is in certain situations very beneficial to, to add a little bit of glutathione to it. Um, you just have to be careful not to increase the pool of the oxidized uh, glutathione. The question that I could never answer, and I talked to the experts that, that I've talked to, um, that why do some individuals not tolerate glutathione and NAC? You know, these are compounds that without them we would be dead so how is it that some don't tolerate them and that is exactly the issue you know they increased you know you have one glutathione molecule that you take orally it binds one toxin and then it becomes oxidized and it's not usable again it's like your car is empty from gas what do you do you go buy a new car or you're going to refuel it and so we do need to constantly stimulate the recycling but if we have at any time the oxidized going up too high we inhibit the methylation, like Alex said, and methylation is there to what? Break down histamine. It, methylation is there to stimulate COMT to break down adrenaline. And then all of a sudden you have these exacerbated symptoms based on these toxicities, based on your SNPs. Yeah, uh, it's a fine balance. I think it's at the right time. It can be beneficial, you know, especially when your glutathione pools are depleted because of other issues of CBS and low homocysteine, you know, or general low cysteine reservoirs in the body. And so all of that needs to be looked at as well, you know, um, 
when we're using the sodium thiosulfate lotion, are there other substances that might synergize or amplify the effect of the lotion? And how are those substances bolstering the effects of the lotion itself? I, I mean, one of the things that I found to be helpful, but it's just in general, trying to push the methylation cycle can be tricky. There's a lot of different things out there. You can take something like you know, trimethylglycine or dimethylglycine. You know, obviously the, the B12s and the folinic acid are, are implicated in there. And I've, I've found that just by using something like beet, I found beetroot powder to be kind of a broad spectrum of minerals. It has some nice TMG content to it. Um, but it's not overbearing. I think that there's some very useful amino acids in it. And it has a lot of positive microbiome properties to it. The, the polyphenols are really good for the gut. So we've we've that's kind of one of the core suggestions that we tag along with it. We put that heavily in our products because of that, because we do think that, you know, you're going to need some supplementation there. And this kind of fits the bill. It's not something that's potent like, taking direct TMG or, or DMG, um, it'll have kind of a broad function to it. You know, I, I think along the lines of that, if you can find a food source that's heavy in some of these minerals and compounds that are very integral, there's a methionine content to it, but it's not like taking pure methionine. I think those are really the most helpful things. So beetroot powder is certainly one of those things. But I would say probably the most important thing that we found really has just been the motility uh, aspect of that, making sure that things are flowing, you know, taking a spectra vitamin. I really like the nicotinamide riboside uh, molecule in terms of helping with, you know, NAD levels. I know there's other options out there, but for some reason that one just seems to be helpful without incident in a lot of people. And we, we put that heavily in our product as well. And that's also implicated in helping to kind of bolster glutathione in itself. You mentioned going with the flow, the topic of constipation. You have created the Motility Max product, has some very interesting ingredients in it. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about some of the explorations that you've had on finding specific substances that were helpful and then how you created that product Motility Max. Yeah, so, you know, I would have basically a list uh, for the people that I worked with. Say here, these are the... 10 things that I think that are the most effective in supporting motility, because there are certainly individuals that are extremely constipated where they, you know, they, they need daily enema, um, or they, you know, they don't go for several days, or they even get taken to the hospital in some extreme cases. So not everybody will need everything. Um, and sometimes starting at the top of the list, it doesn't, you know, that you check that item off, we're taking it, but there's still no improvement. So we've kind of put these things together into one and you can basically scale the dosing as needed to kind of get that therapeutic uh, benefit. So something as simple as, as prune juice, you know, is really, really helpful for motility. We included some prune powder in there. Fennel seed, I found to be really helpful for pushing the motility. There's some ginger components in there. Um, a lot of people will take magnesium, kind of helps draw some water and soften the stool. There's a little bit of magnesium in there. There's a particular probiotic species of bifidobacterium lactis, which has been shown to help with motility. We have that in there as well. Uh, flax seeds have a, have a contribution to detoxification. There's an omega-3 profile to it, but it also helps with motility. L-carnitine, sometimes I've suggested that directly, you can get it as a liquid, it will certainly help soften the stools. I mean, it has kind of a smell to it, but we have our product. It's a nicely flavored. You don't, you know, art, not artificially flavored, but you don't get that smell at all. So L-carnitine is very helpful. It tends to stay in the gut. The L-carnitine component, not the acetyl one, tends to be absorbed a little bit more bioavailably. Um, so those are really kind of the, I'd say, the main components that we have in there that we put together that seem to be the, the most effective in keeping things flowing for most people. Obviously, there's going to be some severe cases. You might need a little bit more tools in there. We need to see if those are appropriate uh, for their use. We didn't talk a whole lot about all of the products that you guys are coming out with. I'm super excited. New tools in the toolbox. I have the Gut Guardian product here that uh, you all have created with research elements. 
So you have the Gut Guardian, you have the Spectrum Max, the Motility Max we talked about. You've got some others that you just released, including Histamine Reprieve, the Oxalate Pull, Ammonia Away. I love that these are for some some of the, the areas in autism and even in adults with chronic illness that are not always super easy to find great tools for looking at oxalates, looking at ammonia. So tell us a little bit more about these products and why you came to this collaboration with researched elements. Yeah, I mean, for the Dr. Bodder and I were talking about getting into this for a very long time, and we we always had difficulty trying to find a supplement, a manufacturer that was going to be okay with the exotic ingredients that we had. It was very difficult to find things like pomegranate peel or some of the other herbs in there. Um, so we would go to a manufacturer and they're like, you know, this is the 15 things that we have, you know, choose from that. We happened to come in contact with uh, all the nutritionals and they were just so into what we were doing. Um, they went all out with every single thing that we wanted. There was no issue in getting them. So that was certainly part of the, the, the issue in not having done this before. The other complication from the microbiome pieces like Gut Guardian was trying to put something together in a balanced way that had, you know, because there, there are going to be people that need more prebiotics. There are going to be people that need more herbal components. How do you really make something to kind of fit everybody? And and it's it's not that it's going to solve everyone's problems, but it's kind of like, you know, making a soup. You start out with the same base, right? There, there's kind of three bases that you start out with. So we tried to formulate in a way that would include a little bit of everything in a certain ratio that would be appropriate for you and you'd be able to access some benefits. At the same time, it would make the specific recommendations of doing this gut balancing with this 16S testing much more condensed, much more feasible. So rather than having to take 12 herbs and three prebiotics and two probiotics and you know two or three antifungals, it cuts it down to maybe a third of that. So you take gut guardian and maybe we spot treat, you really need a more emphasis on red polyphenols or you need more of an emphasis on these particular herbs here that have more of an antifungal component uh, based on what's going on. It's made so that anybody can take it. I take it daily and see benefit. And I think that for the people that are more sick, it's gonna less, it'll make their programs more simple and less complex. And that was the, the intent, not to be the replace everything, but really be the core and then to kind of bridge off of that. And it actually even tastes quite good too. I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the biggest, I mean, that's honestly the biggest hurdle in, in, in autism. Most of these kids do not swallow capsules. So we had to make something and, and we got the flavor, we got the unflavored version and it is just awful. And I can tell you that because that's what I was doing every day with my son for years is try to come up with ways to make things taste better and palatable. So when we got this, these products and we were working with them on the flavor, we we're like, wow, this is going to open the door for so many people that just can't get their kids to take anything. And we realized that we're, eventually we're going to make these available in capsules too for the people that you know don't want to have to actually put a powder in and make it make the shakes. But um, at least at the very least, you can take this. It doesn't taste bad. I feel like I gained a whole bunch of energy points since starting to take this daily. So. I'm excited for the people that are going to be trying it. And, you know, we want to make things that people like and that are going to help them. So we are totally open to the feedback and the improvement. And we've got a lot of that already. So we're, we're hot at work at, you know, trying to make things more feasible and practical. And I actually like that these are available in powders because they're easier to titrate. I think the histamine reprieve, do you have that one in both a powder and a capsule already? Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. Excellent. Excellent. I'll put the link to researched elements in the show notes where people can look into those in more detail. I think there's some really exciting products and excited to see what else you guys come out with. I did notice in some of the products that you do use glutamine, some experts would suggest that glutamine might convert to glutamate and maybe add to excitotoxicity. So is that a real concern or not? Yeah, we, we were on the, and Dr. Bogner will add to this. We were on the fence about this because we know that we have seen that there's a nice potential for glutamine to help out. And there's this big anti-glutamate kind of following, which is not uncalled for, but I, I think that a lot of these you know, anti-oxalate, anti-glutamate followings really 
take over kind of core and limit your your diet or limit what you're eating. And they, they have a negative connotation from that perspective. I think you should kind of try to strive to stay away from things that are artificial and don't intentionally eat things that have, you know, glutamate in them or MSG like that. But uh, at the same time, don't corner yourself. So we know that there's a benefit for, for glutamine. We think that if we put it in there in a, in a small amount and then combine with some of the other tools that could help with, we really think that the glutamate issue is exacerbated, like Dr. Bogner was saying, was by ammonia, uh, particularly in, in ASD. Um, so if you can get a handle on that, then you can really get more access to the benefits of, of glutamine. No, I mean, glutamine does form into eventually into glutamate, but what's wrong with glutamate? Without glutamate, we wouldn't have this conversation. It's a motor neuron uh, neurotransmitter, and it's not the bad guy. Like everybody's saying, glutamate is bad. It's, yeah, because we add glutamate. It's the only acid that tastes like something, and there's no regulations on how much glutamate you can add to food. So obviously too much is bad, but without glutamate, we wouldn't be able to form a sentence. And so it's it's a, not about the concern of that we form too much glutamate. We, glutamate is necessary. The toxicity arises again from not being able to absorb glutamate into the astrocyte because of sodium imbalances. That's the issue with glutamate toxicity and that it doesn't bind the ammonia and the astrocyte, which then forms the glutamine. We know that in autism, for example, we have high glutamate and low glutamine. You know, glutamine is uh, released from muscle tissue, 50 grams every day. What does it do? It repairs and it fuels the immune system. It repairs the GI tract. And so glutamine is important. I, I do not have concerns in that regard. So you just need to, again, keep the cycles going and you need to know what causes toxicity and where in the cycle you need to work on. In more sensitive people with chronic illnesses, adults, maybe with mast cell activation, histamine issues, maybe in children on the spectrum, uh, there can be sensitivity to phenols, to salicylates, which unfortunately are fairly high in many herbs. So what are your thoughts on people tolerating some of these products that do contain lots of herbs? Do we need to work more on microbiome balancing first? Are there other things that we can do to help minimize the sensitivity to phenolics and salicylates? I have to be so thankful of, of the experiences with, with my son, because I feel that you know, we've gone through such an evolution of all of the symptoms and issues with him. My experience with that is that working on the microbiome, those things diminish and basically fade away, uh, you know, to the point where perfumes and, and certain scents and would just kind of cause these extreme reactions and just kind of chipping away at the gut over time. Those things that were burdens before are no longer burdens. It, you know, hear, hearing from some adults too, I, mean, I do work with some adults, they've kind of shared the same thing. You know, I used to be able to do this and now I can't. So there, there obviously something has broken. And so I don't think that you should go out and try to find things that are really laced with these things. And some of these herbs will be very phenolic and stuff, stuff like that. I think the take home message is that in the beginning, you could expect to see some reaction or reactivity initially when you start this. But that doesn't necessarily indicate that it's an inappropriate thing to do. The smart way is to really kind of do things maybe on an every other day basis, do a pulsing mechanism, or bring on things that are going to really quell the histamine out there and know how to know how to handle it. You know, what I've seen over time is that things just become more feasible and accessible. The one herb that caused me strife that I took in the beginning, you know, now I can take three or four capsules of it and I don't get that reaction. Let's talk a little bit about how people can work with you. Is there an opportunity to do the gut balancing program? Alex, I know you're very busy. Are there other practitioners that are also working with that program? And then also how people can work with Dr. Bogner as well. Yeah, so Dr. Bogner is actually versed in the gut balancing too. So he can actually perform it as well. There's kind of a train up there. So there's some practitioners that work with me and have access to this software. They've kind of built it into their practice. So they don't find it follow it exactly the way that I do. But I think some of the core principles are use the literature to help guide you, use the prebiotics to build in where the deficits are. Because I've just been so busy right now, I primarily work with, with children and I do that for free. I don't charge for anything. I mean, there are some adults that I work with just to kind of keep things going, but I've, I've kind of put the kibosh on that just because things are so busy. But, you know, we have some some future goals where we like to make this available for everybody. So we have some 
ideas where we would, you know, have a website where basically you can upload your test and get these suggestions, get some expert kind of opinions and, and advice and have the literature right there so you can read it and see why this compound is appropriate for your dysbiosis or this prebiotic would be beneficial for you. So I think that's kind of the end goal of where we're going right now. But, um, you know, I'm happy to talk to anybody if they want to send me an email. You know, I don't want to ever tell anybody no. You know, that's kind of where I am right now. Excellent. My last question is the same for every guest, and that is, what are some of the things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Lots of clean water. And like I showed you here, mixing all of these together, Gut Guardian and the Spectrum Max, and kind of put away my 300 bottles of other supplements and just seeing how this goes. I mean, with the Gut Guardian and Spectrum Max, I, I lost eight pounds in one week and I didn't exercise more or change my diet. But like Alex said, I have more alertness. I started dreaming again uh, much more intensely even with less sleep, don't have these fatigue symptoms, you know, throughout the day, even if I have four or five consults in a row, you just keep going. And it doesn't cause that caffeine effect, you know, that you're hyper or wired or have a crash effect uh, later. And so that's what I'm doing. There are some other things, you know, I, I, I am a fan of ivermectin. So uh, and not only because of its antiviral properties, but it has anti-inflammatory properties. And and so I don't recommend anybody doing this, of course, without consulting with your physician. But, you know, those are the kind of things I do. I I like to uh, meditate. You know, I like to pray, getting out into nature, you know, touching a tree. I know that sounds weird, but I like the, the energies from the earth. I spend a lot of time behind the desk. And so getting out there, getting some good vitamin D, eat good food, eat good steak, Enjoy my kids, be happy. I think we're doing, you know, dealing with stress, keeping the stress levels down, working with Alex, that makes me happy. So, yeah, I mean, I think if you talk to most parents, you'll find that that, that they're sacrificing themselves for their for their kids and really not thinking about these important questions like, like their health. And honestly, I find myself trying to maximize my time to just do as many things as I possibly can in a day. But I do realize that it builds up on you. And there's a need to bring that balance back for yourself. And it's not only eating, but, you know, healthy foods and, and taking supplements that are going to help you energize you and things like that. But I think it's just balance overall, like, do you have a, a good communication profile in your life? Are you communicating with people? Do you have a hobby or something that interests you or people that are like-minded that you can share experiences with and throw ideas back and forth? And do you have kind of a purpose? I think that that really goes a long way, right? I probably benefit more from working with other people just because I get to hear their experiences and then I get to kind of weigh that against mine. And then certainly it feels good to help somebody else out. But I think just being overall connected, you know, trying not to be stressed out. It's difficult. We live in a stressful world. You know, everything is internet and phone right now and passwords. And there's so many things that can kind of tip you over the edge. But I think it's always healthy to kind of just go go for a walk, go outside, try to de-stress. Think about, you know, if the world was going to end tomorrow, what would you be doing? Diet and all that stuff I think is really important. Trying to stay away from all the processed crap. It's really hard. It's really expensive. It's hard to go down the street and not see a fast food place or go in the supermarket and not see something that's advertised right in your face that that's cheap and you should be buying. Just try to, you know, be whole and balanced and um, take it one day at a time. And just know that there's a lot of other people out there that are suffering worse than you or from the same issues. And I think that gives you some context. I love this conversation. I uh, am so excited to see what your collaboration continues to bring. I think you are both such highly intentioned people. Uh, I think your own experience with your children is going to certainly help the lives of many, many children. And so I just appreciate so much what you're doing. Look forward to continuing to see what comes from your collaborations and appreciate you both for being here and sharing so much with us today. Thank you so much, Scott. It was really an honor. You're great. Thank you, Scott. To learn more about today's guests, see the links in the show notes. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a positive rating or review as doing so will help the show reach a broader audience. To follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. If you'd like to support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. To be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. This and other episodes can be found on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. 
Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit BetterHealthGuy.com.